Um, welcome you all for another medical education video on acute medicine. So today what I'm going to discuss is about management of acute complications after a myocardial infarction. I think this is a very common scenario because as house officers, as junior doctors, you receive patients with ischemic chest pain managed as acute coronary syndrome. Either they have had percutaneous coronary interventions or had thrombolysis or been managed on low molecular weight heparin. So during the clinical course, while in the ward, these patients tend to get many complications. So as doctors, you need to anticipate these complications and should be able to manage them. And at the same time, for medical students, a patient with ischemic chest pain is a common loan case. And usually in the discussion, we tend to ask some questions with regard to management of these acute complications to see whether you'll be a competent doctor who can manage these life-threatening situations, right? So let me take you to a case scenario uh, of a patient. So this is the house officer and you receive a patient to the ward, Mr. Bandara. He's a 55 year old male admitted to the accident and emergency with a ischemic chest pain for three hours duration. That's around one o'clock in the afternoon. And the ECG showed an acute inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. The closest PCI capable center was occupied with three PCIs. So unfortunately they could not accommodate this patient within a couple of hours. So he was treated with the standard therapy, including thrombolysis. So he received tinectabase and luckily the thrombolysis was successful. And now as a house officer, you receive this man in your ward HDU around six o'clock in the afternoon. So it was a successful thrombolysis. Patient is in the HDU, he's pain free. All the vital parameters are stable and you repeat the ECG with short improvement of ST elevations by more than 50%. Right, so you are happy and, but this happens in the middle of the night. So you get a call in the midnight, the nurse calling you, doctor, Mr. Bandara, the patient who was thrombolyzed in the afternoon, he's not doing well. His blood pressure is 70 by 40. Right, what would you be doing? Obviously, you would be doing this. So you'll be running to the patient because low blood pressure in a post-MI patient is a medical emergency. So you might take a few seconds, maybe a minute to reach to the patient. So during this running, there should be a lot of things that, that are processing in your mind because low BP in a post-MI patient could be due to many things. So you need to consider what could be the reason why Mr. Bandar is having low blood pressure, right? So before going into the management, I would like to take you through a few possibilities why this man's blood pressure is low, right? So mind you, he had an acute inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. So if you look at this heart, yes, so this is the right coronary artery. And usually when there is a total occlusion of the right coronary artery, it gives rise to the inferior myocardial infarction because that is the vessel which supplies the inferior part of the heart, right? So along with that, the right ventricle is also supplied from the right coronary artery. So in a patient who is having an inferior MI can have a right ventricular infarction as well. So when there is a right ventricular infarction, the right ventricle doesn't contract properly. So there is no blood going into the lungs. At the same time, there's no blood coming to the left side of the heart. So your stroke volume goes down and your blood pressure goes down. It's very simple, right? So in this patient, it could be a RV infarction. But what are the physical signs? So what are the clinical features of a RV infarction? Obviously, you will have a low blood pressure, but the lungs will be clear. The reason being, RV is not pumping blood to the pulmonary circulation. So the lungs will be clear, but when the blood accumulates in the right side of the heart, it leads to elevated right-sided pressures and your JVP can go up. Okay, so this is one of many possibilities. So what are the other possibilities? Well, this can be a reinfarction in the same vascular territory or another vascular territory. So this may, man may be so unfortunate that he gets another MI on top of the inferior stem. It may be in the right coronary or it may be in the left anterior descending or left main stem. So this may patient may be having acute left ventricular failure leading to high low blood pressure, right? So you need to consider the possibility of another myocardial infarction, right? And the arrhythmias. 
very common, particularly in inferior MIs. The reason being, as we discussed, inferior MI, the culprit vessel is most of the time the right coronary artery. And as you know, the right coronary artery not only supplies the, uh, the right ventricle and the inferior wall, but it also supplies, in most of the patients, the SA node and the AV node. So these are two important areas in the conduction system of the heart. So when there is ischemia to the SA node and AV node because of the RV uh, inferior MI, the patients can develop bradyarrhythmias. So this may be a severe sinus bradycardia or maybe a higher degree heart block, like second degree heart block or a complete heart block. So your heart rate goes down and in very simple terms, you know, cardiac output equals to stroke volume into heart rate. So when the patient is profoundly bradycardic, your cardiac output is going to go down with, along with the blood pressure. And at the same time, not only bradyarrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias can also give rise to low blood pressure. Sometimes when after a MI, the heart is super irritable. So they can have various, various sorts of arrhythmia. So they can be, there can be supraventricular uh, tachyarrhythmias like a fast AF or a uh, SVT, or there can be ventricular arrhythmias, which are more complicated and more fatal, ventricular tachycardias and ventricular fibrillation, right? So this man may be having an arrhythmia leading to low blood pressure. Okay, it's not all. There are many other possibilities. So after a myocardial infarction, when the vessel wall is infarcted, your papillary muscles can dysfunction. And the papillary muscles are, I mean, the cusps of the heart are attached to the papillary muscles with chordae tendine. So there can be a chordae rupture or papillary muscle dysfunction, which can lead to acute valvular incompetencies or acute valvular regurgitation, which can give rise to low blood pressure. Okay, so you should not forget bleeding because for this man, you have given tinectopase, which is a thrombolytic agent, and you have started him on inoxaparin you have given dual antiplatelets. So he's at high risk of bleeding. Say for instance, if this patient is a known patient with peptic calcer disease, with the, all this treatment, he might have had a torrential GI bleed. So this is malina, this is hematemesis. So the blood pressure may be low due to bleeding. And sometimes patient may be having bleeding elsewhere. I have had a patient who had an inferior STEMI with a heart block. So at the onset patient had a fall and he bumped his buttock area, but he did not come up with that story. So he came with chest pain, inferior MI, he was thrombolyzed, and then his blood pressure crashed and HB was dropping. But he was not having any malina or hematemesis. Later, we found that he has got a big buttock hematoma. Usually the buttock area and the thigh area can accommodate a large volume of blood without manifesting outside, unless you look very objectively. Right? So this man may be bleeding. Okay, so this may be due to medications, right? So we start a lot of medications in a MI patient and some medications can lead to low blood pressure. Particularly in inferior MI, there can be right ventricular dysfunction. It may be not right ventricular failure per se, but it may be not functioning properly. So the right ventricle is very preload sensitive. So if you start him on nitrates or diuretics, which will reduce the preload, which may the GTN might reduce the venous return to the heart. So the volume that comes to the right ventricle is low, and then the patient can develop low blood pressure, right? So GTN diuretics, which need to be avoided in a patient with the inferior MI with possible RV dysfunction. And at the same time, we start them on a lot of other antihypertensive medications. We start them on beta blockers to give them the prognostic benefit, a mortality benefit. But sometimes with an ACE inhibitor, the patient may have first dose hypertension. Sometimes with beta blockers, patient may have bradycardia. So always you have to consider the medications as a culprit or low blood pressure in this sort of patients. Anaphylaxis, lower down in the list, but still possible because this patient was started on several medications, dual antiplatelets, statins, is getting heparin, he's getting a lot of drugs. So the patient can develop allergic reactions and anaphylaxis, which can account for low blood pressure. Well, so this man had a MI because he's an arteriopath. He has atherosclerotic disease in the coronary arteries. 
So can't he have the same pathology in the big vessels? Yes, he can. So the blood pressure may be measured in the right arm throughout, which shows a normal blood pressure. But when you check the blood pressure in the left arm, there is a big atherosclerotic plaque in the subclavian artery. So the recording in the left arm may be low. So there can be blood pressure discrepancy in both arms. So depending on which arm you measure the blood pressure, blood pressure value may change. Right. Well, so after listening to all this, there are many possibilities. So you are running to the patient, just few seconds, but so many things will need to process in your mind to look for an exact cause why this man's blood pressure is low, right? So now we are with the patient. So as always in medical emergencies, airway, breathing and circulation. So I'm not going to go into detail about airway and breathing. Let's assume you run to the patient, Mr. Bandara, and he says he's feeling bit dizzy, uh, no chest pain. Basically he's talking. So if the patient is talking, his airway breathing is all right. And you reconfirm the blood pressure and it is 70 by 40, right? Okay, then what would you do? Well, so here, this is a medical emergency, right? So you can't take the history and then examine, then wait for the investigations to start management. So all these things need to run simultaneously, right? So you need to take a very focused history, thinking all the possibilities. You need to do a targeted examination covering all the possibilities and the investigations should be minimum and if at all should be bedside investigations. And along with these three, you need to start managing the patient, right? So let's see in the history. So in the history, obviously the first thing you would ask, you would check is whether the patient is symptomatic or not, right? So because of the low blood pressure, he may be having symptoms of cerebral hypoperfusion. He may be feeling dizzy. And then you can ask about chest pain, shortness of breath, orthopnea, because he thought this may be a reinfarction or a uh, infarction in a different vascular territory. And about palpitations, fast palpitations, slow palpitations. And you can ask about bleeding manifestations, whether he has any melina, any hematemesis, whether he has had any fall before coming, whether he has got any pain elsewhere, important. And we thought anaphylaxis lower down in the list. So any itching, any rashes, any V's is important. And also along with the history, always refer to the drug chart and see whether he was given any diuretics, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, or vasodilators. Right, so examination, again, it's a very targeted examination. You can't do all system examinations, but make sure you measure the blood pressure in both arms and feel the pulse, what's the pulse rate, what's the pulse volume, whether there is any radio radial delay. Even without waiting for ECG, you can look at the ECG tracing in the cardiac monitor, right? You can look for any new ST elevations or in all sorts of arrhythmias, sometimes a complete heart block or a tachyarrhythmia, you can easily pick up in looking at the cardiac monitor and see whether the patient is pale, whether he has any bleeding manifestations, any bruises, and auscultate the precordium for a new murmur. This may be due to acute valvular regurgitation. And look at the JVP and examine the lung bases. Do this very meticulously because a clear lung base versus a lung base full of repetitions, your management is going to change completely. Right. Okay. And the investigations. You can't wait for all investigations, but simply you can do a ECG. And if you suspect a bleeding, or if the patient looks pale, you can look for an urgent hemoglobin. Right, so Mr. Bandara, let me give you my examination and history findings. So he says he's feeling a bit dizzy, no chest pain, no palpitations, no bleeding. And when you examine him, he's not pale. His heart rate is 96 beats per minute. So, the blood pressure in both arms, 70 by 40 mercury millimeters. You find he has elevated JVP, no murmurs, and lungs are clear. So then you had so many possibilities to start with, but now you have narrowed down your diagnosis to possible RV infarction. Right. So how do you confirm the diagnosis? So before confirming, the ECG itself can give us some useful hints whether the right ventricle is, ventricle is infarcted or not. So 
along with the st elevations in lead 2 3 and avf if you see an st elevation in v1 or an st elevation in v1 with an st depression in v2 or st segment is isoelectric in v1 but there is a st depression in v2 that can sort of hint there could be a rv infarction usually in inferior stemis when the right ventricle is infarcted the st elevation in lead 3 is greater than lead 2 right but then you can easily do a ecg with right sided leads right so how do you do this right sided leads so usually you take the ecg the chest leads are attached to the left side but in this patient we have attached the chest leads to the right side and the v4 in the right side directly looks at the right ventricle so this is the ecg of mr bandara you can as you can see there's st elevation in 2 3 avf but can you see classically his st elevation in lead 3 is higher than lead 2 and along with that you can see an st elevation in v1 as well and we have done the right sided leads and the v4r clearly shows an st elevation right so now we have confirmed the diagnosis of st elevation so what's the acute management well very simple terms it's fluids fluids and fluids so we give fluids to increase the right ventricular filling pressure so you can start with a normal saline bolus 250 to 500 milliliters check for the blood pressure response and you can go for one to two liters of fluids to increase the rv filling right always make sure in the acute period where you manage an rv infarction you need to avoid nitrates diuretics other vasodilators and ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Basically, don't give drugs that will reduce the preload, that will reduce the venous return, and vasodilators and other antihypertensives. And I think the beta blocker also should come here if the patient's blood pressure is marginal. Right. So if the patient is not improving, which is less likely because most of the patients will respond to the fluid challenge, but we can consider inotrope support if only if other measures fail so this is in red because we have commonly seen patients in the ward inferior stemi developed hypotension and without any fluids patients are uh, patients are started either on dobutamine and or adrenal, which is a very long practice so you look for rv infarction confirm it and give fluids and after one to two liters of fluid still the blood pressure is not adequate you can consider giving some hand drop support and if the patient's response is poor, you can get the cardiology team involved and go for a reperfusion of the right coronary artery. Right. So in this patient, Mr. Bandar, he got one liter of normal saline and his blood pressure improved to 110 by 80 and he survived that night. But the next day, Mr. Bandar's clinical course got further complicated. So we are going to discuss a few more uh, complications after acute myocardial infarction, and I will discuss it in part two. All right. Thank you very much for listening. Have a nice day.